Good evening, everybody. How are you all doing? Welcome back to Question at Time Live uh, episode, what, 89? Wow, we're approaching the 100. It's not going to be long now. Cannot believe how long that's all been chewing away. So first things first, I've got the technical issues from last week all fixed, which I'm super, super pleased to say uh, my wonderful Sparky has been and sorted all the Ethernet connections out in the office. So I've got a hardwired connection that isn't going to let me down now unless there's some massive BT disaster, which who knows, that could happen. Uh, but no, other than that, we are in the game. So really, really pleased with that. And I've got a hell of a lot of stuff lined up for this week. It might end up being a bit of a bumper show, to be fair, because uh, I've got the announcement on the Battle of the Breeders event, which I know everybody's been eagerly anticipating. Plenty of info on that, which is going to include a little bit of coy appreciation as well. Last week's video, which I really wanted to share with you, featuring my super male pond. Uh, got all that working, an absolute treat now, seeing though the connection uh, is back on track. So, uh, yeah, and then uh, a few few topics as well, to be fair, that, uh, that I want to cover. So I've got everything here. If you see me, uh, my head bobbing around, because obviously I've got the, the screen to manage. I've got all my notes. Uh, and, yeah, I've really spent a lot of time this week to get everything uh, right, not going to lie, last week was a bit tough Changed the setting uh, with, with the internet connection, everything it was My head was scrambled, to be fair, by the end of it And uh, yeah, it, it felt like uh, a bit of a slog If I'm not going to lie, uh, that's just me Because I knew things weren't right But yeah, back on this week And I'll have plenty of time to make sure uh, everything is in order So yeah, there we go. I suppose we should probably have a look first. Uh, see who is in the house. Fire them up on the screen. So good evening to everybody who uh, is joining us week in, week out. It's amazing to uh, to spend some time with you all. So, yeah, it's been an absolutely chaotic uh, period. I'm, to be honest with you, I'm not going to lie. I am feeling it at the minute. Uh, it's absolute chaos at work and my uh i don't know i get my own way at times to be fair but there's a lot a lot going on a lot spinning and uh yeah some days just don't want to uh i don't know i want to say not get out of bed that's that's not how i am but you just can't sign and wait for it to uh to end yep there we go look all uh, all working fantastic even though everyone beacon coy is in the house yeah, great to see you all. The numbers that over the past few weeks have been absolutely fantastic, which is uh, it was always great to uh, to see. And plenty of you in uh, this evening, which is amazing. So there we go. So let's not forget, first and foremost, uh, I'm not going to have loads of time for questions this evening, but please do fire them in, and I will make sure we feed, uh, we do get a fair few in because. Uh, of course, it's question time live, and without me answering any questions, uh, I'm, I'm mis-selling you there, aren't we? I don't want to be doing that. So, yeah, on to a bit of news. So, bits I have got uh, lined up. Obviously, the event coming up, we're going to drop that uh, kind of halfway through or towards the end, all the information, along with some of the fish that are going to be featured in that. Uh, I think you can probably tell from the name Battle of the Breeders, there isn't just one breeder involved this year. There's actually not even two. There is uh, quite a few, and they're all heavy hitters, which is the really exciting part of it. Uh, yeah, in other news, so I am. This is the Koi Talk podcast studio that I'm in now. Seeing as all the camera equipment and everything's in here, I thought it'd be better to get the question time set up in as well to save chugging it all next door into my office. Uh, and yeah, I'm glad to say I've been back in the studio with Chris. Uh, we've been filming uh, the podcast, which we are doing. We're doing again next week. But the first edition of that, uh, or say the first, the most recent edition is going to drop on the Koi Talk YouTube channel and all the podcast channels on Sunday. So barring any technical errors, which there shouldn't be, uh, I've got all the footage and everything done. It's looking an absolute treat. With all the upgrades and bits and bobs that we've done, I hope you're going to absolutely love it. It's something we thoroughly enjoy doing, a bit of a, just a natter between coin nerds, really. Um, we get to share it all with you guys. So look out for that dropping on Sunday. And please do let us have your feedback on what you think. Uh, and certainly think to the new studio. If there's any particular topics you want covering, uh, we're always happy to uh, to listen to that. 
Uh, yeah, obviously the internet connection's done. And then, yeah, that moves me on to one uh, one platform that I'm really yet to tackle, which does excite me because I've seen some really cool stuff and the platform itself is cool, is TikTok. Now, I'm not sure how many of you guys are actually on there or how much Koi content's being consumed yet, but it's a very, very different kind of vibe to, I think, YouTube and Facebook and, and all the rest of it. And uh, I'm seeing that people do tend to sort of let their hair down a little bit more on that platform. So I have finally, I've come up with a bit of a concept. I kind of stayed away from it for such a long time because I haven't truly known how I wanted to, to do TikTok, to be fair, and what kind of content I wanted to deliver on it. But now I've got a few ideas in my head. Uh, it's all going to be relying around me having a bit of a dose, uh, a kind of man up, to be fair. And uh, yeah, I think being a bit more down to earth, I'm kind of thinking Koi Wholesale Uncensored might have to be the kind of topic for that one. Generally, I do find it quite hard. Social media is a is an absolute battle, uh, to be fair. You know, my motive for starting all this and doing it was to, to, I think, bring more joy to the koi keeping hobby, to be fair, by sharing education that I know would make things koi keeping, you know, more enjoyable, simpler for people as well, and take away some of the snobbery. Uh, that was really the important bit behind it and bringing good, honest, solid information that's come from decades of experience and not just, you know, information that's passed around without people truly knowing what they're talking about. And that's all been good. And I've really got used to being in front of camera, to be fair, absolutely cringed uh, to begin with. It was it was hard work and God, I felt uptight. And although I have relaxed a hell of a lot, I think there's still a lot of me that doesn't really come across in all this because in truth the bit sometimes it's wincing social media is great there's a load of great communities that follow me follow chris the whole koi wholesale thing koi talk thing all along but there is obviously in all social media a hell of a lot of negativity and i'm not gonna lie some of that stuff at times is pretty hard to deal with there's a lot of total shitheads out there to be frank and uh yeah it kind of it kind of does make you clam up a little bit. It certainly does me, but I'm hoping the more and more I come relaxed and certainly as I feel more and more love from you guys that I can ease into this, certainly with the content recently doing the Nishkigoi Journal videos on the channel where it's just been me and my phone, I have felt a very different dynamic uh, from that and felt more relaxed anyway. So fingers crossed with that. So feel free if you are on TikTok and you've not yet followed us, it's uh, at Koi underscore wholesale. I'll try and get that on a banner before the end. I'm sure you can get it just by searching it up anyway. And look forward to some videos dropping on there. And let's, uh, if I can get relaxed, let's see who can upset in the first couple of weeks and giving that a shot. But who knows? Fingers crossed because it's right there. The phone's always with me and I can catch some of them moments that I hopefully bring you guys a lot of information and entertainment as well, uh, which is, you know, the real important thing in the hobby. So fingers crossed. Let's uh, let's see where we where we get up, where, where we'll get with that one. But yeah, honestly, the, the social media thing, I know it's just part of life and difference of opinion uh, is all fair enough. But yeah, some of the some of the stuff at times is is an absolute. It's just a bitch, really. But that's where we are. It's not stopped me yet. And uh, I will keep trying my best, guys, to be fair. Uh, so what else have I got on my list here? Let's have a look. I've already covered last week. That was a nightmare. But like I say, we've got, uh, got the video uh, all set up. Uh, don't clam up. Yeah, Craig, it's not okay. It's just naturally mate how it is uh, i'm happy to keep sharing and i think so far you know been a very open in what i've shared although it might seem simple at times and not that much you know there's not much i do actually leave uh out when i'm talking to you you know a lot of the stuff in how i raise fish grow fish select fish all that's all been there on camera for anyone to learn from that anyone even being competitors in business uh, as well and you know and that's that's always a risk but you know for the greater good and the greater good of the industry it's all stuff i've wanted to get out there and uh and share with people so uh jason coy appreciate that buddy i really do let's have a look uh 
Johnny Coy's in the house as well. Good evening, buddy. Uh, yeah, so first one, bit of a, a topic I, you might have seen. I've been, well, we've had a few quotes being farmed out. I think that's nice content. As we're working through content, making snippets, there's sometimes the odd lines that are quite interesting. And uh, yeah, this is this is what I've been thinking about for a while. And to be honest with you, me and Chris might drill into this more depth in a podcast because I don't want to take too much of everyone's time up uh, on this. But there's a saying in a, a quote I recently shared, if I got it out, was something along the lines of the most uh, important factor uh, or the biggest secret in raising koi successfully is feeding. And that's one to really provoke uh, a conversation, really. But the reason I said it is there's a saying that's gone around in this uh, industry for as long as, I, as I've been in it. You don't keep koi, you keep water. Now, I'm going to throw it out there that that is an absolute load of bollocks if you want to be truly successful at raising koi to the highest levels. And and then in that, in the growth aspect, you know, the bodies, the skin condition, all the rest. Now, before that gets blown out of context, I'm not saying that the water is not important. Of course it, of course it is. But you cannot underestimate how important getting the food element of all this is. Uh, in that scenario, because I think it's three or four breeder interviews we've done for the magazine, and everyone, when they spoke about raising koi, the first thing each of those breeders mentioned, and these are breeders of the highest caliber, was food. Food, 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 food. And this is a lot, you know, the biggest thing I focus on in my koi keeping before anything is let's get the feeding right and then work from there. You know, then work on getting the environment right based on that feeding levels, uh, dealing with the water, adjusting the system, making the necessary adjustments to cope with the feeding levels that are going in. But if you don't truly know how to feed koi properly, despite giving them the temperature, uh, despite giving them the best water, you name it, the best filtration, everything that there is, if you don't know how to feed them fish properly, you ain't going to produce that absolute peak level of body and skin condition. Now, that might not, I completely get it. If that's not the area of the hobby that you're into, great. But the, the point behind that concept is you can go, I've seen fish, you know, where the whole focus is on keeping the water and that becomes the sole focus. You're not keeping water. It's not a water keeping hobby. You are keeping koi. And it's about providing what's right for them. And in keeping water, people get wires crossed with that as well, where they start obsessing over clarity, start obsessing over TDS readings, uh, you know, how parameters fluctuate, all these little things uh, where in the meantime, if you're not getting that feeding right, food and nourishment is a massive, massive part. Health and well-being, absolutely everything. And that then is not just about the food either. This I'm talking feeding levels, the temperatures come into this as well, but ultimately you've got to get, no matter what your temperature is, getting that feeding right will affect so much. So that's that's where that comment come from, just for further kind of explanation on that. And it's something I've just watched for years and still as I watch breeders now, food, food, every conversation I have, it's about feeding food. That is the main thought on their thing. It doesn't matter how good the genetics are, you name it, if you can't feed a fish with the best potential in the world, you don't get the, the nutrition and the feeding levels right, you ain't going to develop it. And this will stem, you know, feeding will affect health, it affects skin luster, it affects color quality, absolutely everything, just like with us human beings, fish are no different. Waters are then, you know, you look at things to tweak, yeah, in there, you know, water, managing that then afterwards, water temperatures, all the rest of it, that's all the stuff that eventually comes in, in my opinion, and certainly from the way I do it. And, you know, as I'm sitting here, I don't I don't think I need to justify anymore the methods that I've got and the style in which I'm koi keeping. My evidence is laid bare for you guys absolutely all the time for you to see. And, uh, yeah. There it is, you know, and this is then just also keeping those fish are all very happy, healthy fish. You know, this is not just like they're there grown and, and looking absolutely knackered. They're in absolutely top condition and there is thousands of them kicking around, you know. So, uh, yeah, that's that was that one, really. I just thought I wanted to expand on that and I probably will expand on it further over on the, the Koi Talk podcasts. 
But uh, for now, I've just got one more while I'm on that topic of food, because this is some. Oh, here we go. Look, <laughs> I knew he'd crop up. So if you haven't could, have, this is Neil, my pal, the Sparky, who thanks to him, uh, you've got this crystal clear streaming and you will also have, uh, yeah, the video playing in a bit. So cheers, Neil. Bailed us out again, mate. Uh, Johnny Coy, it's often said that we are what we eat. It's no different with the Coy to get the best. You have to feed the best. Yeah, Johnny, and it's not just about feeding the best as well. It's the feeding the right amounts. You know, I think I've mentioned, uh, or it's actually something me and Chris were discussing in the podcast, you know, the amount of kind of malnourished fish I do often see, not necessarily from you guys' side, the hobby side, but certainly in the trade, a, a lot of uh, resellers online really, really, you know, quite disappointing to see at times, but it's just amazing how it completely flattens. The fish with the best potential will look like shit if it isn't fed properly uh, in the environment that it's living in. It really does make a huge difference. But on the... Uh... Yeah, I appreciate that, Craig. Uh, on the food topic, because this has been one, so I've also been been dishing a bit of Saki Akari love out. I can't help... Uh, but do it to be fair. And I think it's fair to say there's another Japanese brand, FD, and I don't mind mentioning it whatsoever. Uh, if Saki vanished, it would be probably the next, it would be my next choice uh, if it was available. But I just love how there's a lot of gullible, gullible people out there falling for a bit of marketing hype. And I have, I'm not going to say fell victim of, but some of the comments that I've seen where I, I have been being told that, uh, you know, FD is the food of choice for the majority of the best breeders. And this coming from people, as far as I'm aware, uh, haven't been to Japan particularly all that much, if at all. But what they have managed to see is some of the Facebook posts that are put out there by distributors with Dainichi there with his uh, FD food, speaking to Kenny Baba, the FD, uh, the MD, sorry. And yeah, from that and the words put out by people selling the food, all of a sudden, all of Japan's feeding FD. I just find it remarkable how uh, people just fall for the hype. Now, there'll be critics out there that say, that's exactly what I'm doing with Hikari food. Now, let me tell you with that, the only reason I push this so much and the, the education around trying to get your head around why I do push it is for this very reason when products all of a sudden crop up that haven't been in the marketplace, aren't particularly all that much, and they are hyped through marketing. And I'm not saying it's a bad food because it is a very good food. It's not Saki Akari, and I know that. And why do I know that? Because I've used it. Years and years and years ago, like with just about every other food in the marketplace, I have first-hand experience of it under my scrutiny and that experience of using so many foods and what I expect from a food, which isn't just looking at waste, how a lot of people do assess it. And uh, yeah, to be told by people who spend far less time in Japan than I do that uh, it's the food of choice, I just find absolutely staggering, to tell you the truth. And I have been in just about every breeder's fish houses, food huts. And I'll tell you what I do see a lot of, Saki Akari bags and not many FD ones. And I'm not doubting that Dainichi do use it. I do know Dainichi do, and a lot, a few big breeders do. But it's not as popular as it's uh, as it's being made out to be. Uh, but yeah, like I say, I just find it fascinating that I'm being told that. And just coming back to uh, the Saki thing, you know why I do this. It's not just because you will know I don't put, I mean, I'm not selling any products. The only thing I'm generally trying to sell you guys every now and again is a few decent fish, but I don't sell products. I have absolutely no sponsorships, no anything from anybody whatsoever. You know, even some of the changes with the magazine have been so I don't feel obliged to anybody. And I can just speak honestly and truthfully from that knowledge and experience that I've got. And, uh, that product, not only is, I keep saying it, product, sorry, Ikari, Saki Ikari is the best koi product ever made. I stand by that. It's just because it is remarkable. There is no hype. Everyone who uses it, and there's very few products in life you can ever say this about, 
sees the difference. They see the value. But the biggest reason why I say this is, and this is also what I found fascinating, actually. So I've not looked at any of the price in retail pricing, but I then uh, went on to look at the pricing of FD. The color food is the one I compared. And 15 kg of FD color is a whole 30 pound dearer than a sack of 15 kg sake color, which blew my mind. And yeah, this is it's just, just consumer awareness. That's the bit that gets me because there is marketing hype going on here. Not from me. This is just the truth of how I see it, why I stick by this and how you guys should see it. You know, conversion ratios. We're looking at it pound for pound. And I know there's a chance, you know, you're out there thinking, my God, I can't keep Koi if I, if I can't use Saki Akari. That's not true either. You know, there's plenty of other foods out there that do a good job. It's just when none of these products, I don't think are particularly cheap unless you go to the absolute lowest end uh, of it. And that's, this is the bit I want you to get at. It's consumer awareness of actually getting the best bang for your buck. Now, I see the issue with this is the entry level more often than not on that initial bag. But when we actually consider, like I've shown in the past, price per kilo, that's really, really important. You look at the price per kilo, not just the, the, the value that's in front of you, the price that's in front of you on the initial bag. It only starts at 2 kg, which doesn't help it. But then we go beyond just looking at that initial price. And if we had more data on conversion ratios, and I can tell you just from seeing it and experience of, of kilos fed to kilos gained, that is when you would see the true value. And it's at that point, then really you assess that that's without looking at all the other kind of, uh, I'm saying tangibles, you can't physically touch, but you can see them, you know, skin luster, health and well-being, all the other stuff. And I just believe in it so much. If there's a way you could physically adapt your uh, koi keeping, you know, budget, if there's even areas where you could possibly make a few savings to be able to have that, I know what an impact that will have to your koi keeping. Even if we just look at it then down from a health perspective, but I know at that point you're getting truly the best value money. And this is the only reason I go on for it so much. It's getting into that mindset of why I choose to stick with it as well. You know, I could make savings of tens of thousands a year by switching out to, to all the diets, but it just wouldn't make sense. Not when, you know, I'm paying less, but in the end, I probably wouldn't be paying less because I'd be using more and more. I probably wouldn't be able to use as more because it would just be trashing the ponds. And again, all from first-hand experience. So I just wanted to reiterate, because I don't want anybody thinking out there again either that, you know, if I can't use that, it's you're not going to be doing uh, the best for your koi. There are other good foods out there. I have mentioned Takazumi a few times, which I do believe is a good food developed uh, under own, their own recipe and research. Uh, probably the one where I'd be at, to be honest with you, if I didn't have any of the Japanese ones as an option. But please, guys, don't just fall for this marketing spiel and rubbish that gets thrown out there. Uh, it's bonkers. If we believe that and knowing how the Japanese are with, with you know, cozying up to people for a picture uh, with this brand promotion, you know, if we based it on that alone, 95% of the breeders in Japan would be using JPD. And trust me, although there might be loads of JPD banners and food tubs in there, I've been in one of them fish houses where it's littered with JPD merchandise and in the food tubs with Saki Akari. Probably don't need to say uh, any more than that, but it's always a great topic. I will continue to uh, discuss it. You know, at that point, I was just sort of like, I don't need to carry on doing this because what is the point uh, of battling with people, trying to convince them it's the best way to spend your money, your budget, you've got to spend on your pond if they don't want to listen. But I feel too strongly about it. Like I say, I get absolutely nothing from it. The only thing I want to see from it is you getting the very best for your koi and spending those dollars that you've got to spend on your pond in the best possible way. Like I say, if that's making, if there's anywhere else you can make compromises to get to that, I know you'll be happy and it'll be the best decision you've ever made. Likewise, just to reiterate, if you can't, please don't feel like, uh, you know, you're not doing the best for your koi because there are other good, affordable foods uh, out there. Uh, enough of that waffling on. Uh, let's get to some questions. I see Mr. Hadfield is in the house. How are you doing, buddy? Uh, hope you've got over your jet lag and had another good trip, pal. 
Uh, right, let's. Uh, I'm gonna have to scroll back up here to see where we've got to, guys, because the questions are firing in. And yeah, we've got over 200 tuned in on the live, which is amazing. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Mike, what is the biggest koi you have personally grown? So at the minute, uh, at the facility, I have got the big NND Marusho Sankey, which I know she's just about touching ATCM now. Never really bothered pushing big fish too much, but it, I was actually inspired to do that after, again, I saw some uh, some of the know-it-alls commenting that I only overgrow Tosai to Nisai, and that's easy to do. So uh, I thought, fuck it, let's bring some of my uh, weapons back from Japan and show people what can be done. And yeah, that video will be coming at some point. That growing period is easing to an end in that pond, probably towards the end of March. And I cannot wait to get them out and show you exactly what's been done with raising them and see where they go uh, next year and beyond, to be honest. But yeah, nice question. Uh, Alvin, can you let me know how deep Japanese breeders Tosai, Sanzai, or Yonzai ponds are? Uh, yeah, generally, you see a lot of it because the fish houses and the way they're built, generally around 1.5 to 2 metres uh, is the depth of most of the ponds uh, out there from what I've seen. Some sales ponds tend to be uh, shallower, around a metre or so, but the majority of keeping ponds will be around that 1.5 to, to 2 metres, but depth is not all that important. You know, uh, it really is a waste going deeper. I think 1.5 is the most you generally ever need to go to, uh, in all honesty, when when constructing a koi pond. Let's have a look. Yeah, so what would you describe as the correct amount to feed? How can we work that ratio out? So the method I've often described, and I believe there is a video on the YouTube channel about this in the secrets of koi keeping section, but uh, on there, you can get, oh, sorry, the general method through the feeder, if if we're warm enough, 22, 24 degree region, uh, if we're on an every two hour cycle, how I gauge it. And like I said, a very simple way of using time. So if you, if you don't want to push it too hard, we initially start off with a five minute window. So from the feeder finishing to, or from the feeder starting, sorry, to then finishing eating, is a five minute window. So when you in, eventually find that threshold, you can then use that to manage. Because as you manage a feed, naturally as the fish grow and you're using a feeder, you're going to have to feed more food. So as you see the time drop from say five minutes to four minutes, you just give the feeder an adjustment to try and pull it back to five minutes. And you can keep going all season long with that and just monitoring your parameters. Your pond will go through spikes. It's a natural process. Uh, as you increase the feeding, you'll expect some spikes. You've got to bear with them. It's just if they persist for a very long time, but naturally the filter will catch up and pull it down, providing that the pond is all set uh, properly. So, uh, yeah, generally that's what I use. I do like to push it up to a 10-minute feed window, and then there's even some ponds I'll go up to 20 minutes, and then others, certainly with the bigger fish, I have them on a three-hour uh, feed cycle and allow an hour for eating between feeds. So just because they're a lot slower and a lot more graceful in that process, it takes them a lot longer to, to get the food down. Uh, <laughs> yes, there you go. It is Koi Kicks, absolutely. Oh, there's another one. Uh, is FD made by the same people that made Saki Kari? No, uh, Saki Kari is made by, uh, the, the company is called Kirin. Or Kirin. Uh, the brand they have is Akari. FD is made by FD, uh, two completely separate companies. Jason, I never had better results when I moved to Saki. Koi, water, everything. Yeah, and that's, to be honest, one of the big things uh, when I've often said it, oh, here's Lee, look, evening, buddy. I said it, you know, it's not necessarily in your guy's situation where you're keeping the stocking levels a lot lower, uh, you won't notice this as much. But in my scenario, why I say it's become one of the secrets and a huge part of my whole philosophy is that what I'm doing in such small bodies of water with such high stocking levels and getting such results, that is where the magic is. Because as those stocking levels go up, resources get stretched, and more importantly, feeding levels have to go higher just to compensate for the amount of fish. It's at that point... If the food I am using is not getting the conversion ratio and they're just shitting it out and producing heavy waste as well, 
the water quality is going to deteriorate so quickly that I just won't be able to get the quantity of food into them. And I know that, again, from past foods fed, that within no time the water pollution becomes unmanageable at the high feeding levels. And that's where they really become exposed. And that's, again, probably a scenario that won't really affect you guys depending on your stocking level. But trust me, when it gets up there, I couldn't do what I'm doing with those ponds and systems with anything else. I can get so far, but not to the extremes I've been getting to. And I know that from first-hand experience. But again, it's just some relativity. It probably doesn't matter to you. But when you then consider that I'm doing that in that environment and you consider your environments where you'll probably have it be much more luxurious in general, you think of the, the uh, results you can get at that, that's when it gets even more exciting. Uh, no, I haven't had a nosy at the testing lab. That one has been on the list for a long time, kind of like a, an open invitation. I just never managed to get round to it. But one I want to make a concerted effort on, and more than anything, just speak to the, some of the uh, the tech guys there because, yeah, best in the business for sure. Uh, another one there, best change ever made, absolutely. Uh, Roy Booth, hi Ricky, new to the hobby, August 23. Uh, what realistic growth should I expect this year in an unheated pond? My fish are all between 25 and 30 cm. Yeah, you just got to, you don't really have any expectations, Roy, and just do the absolute best that you can when it's unheated. Be ready uh, when you've got uh, the heat waves or the, when you hit them in the 20s, have the grow food to hand. It's really, really hard to use an automatic feeder. Uh, when you are unheated because of the instability in the temperature. You really need the stability to be able to build the feed in uh, and really get the most from it. But yeah, just, just be ready. Uh, when it is warm enough, you know, get as much growth food down them as possible uh, and do your best. I wouldn't have any expectations. I couldn't really tell you how far I could push stuff in an unheated pond because I've, it's just not what I've done. I don't tend to push them. Uh, when it is unheated but even still you know maximum growth rates really with toe sight in this eye uh, probably where you're at you can be getting around a centimeter or just under a week just over when you're really doing well so you know if you get anywhere near that you're doing exceptionally well but i would say just do your best and be ready for the warm weather coming uh, and just keep that feed nice and consistent as well when you you've not quite got that uh, but it is it is tough. That instability makes it difficult to get predictable results. With the setup that I've got, I know I'm growing them tosi over a centimeter a week uh, with ease. I can pretty much know now as well in a pond or whatever environment it is exactly what can be achieved from start to finish in, in what time period. But that is with a great level, like I say, of predictability and stability. Uh, right, guys, I'm just going to I'll try and dig one more question out and then I'm going to let the video run uh, just while I rehydrate and then we'll get to it. We will only feed Saki from now on. It's the people that buy Ikari and think uh, it's Saki. Oh, yeah. Uh, and to be fair, please do. And that is another one. You see why I'm not a complete nut for it. You know, the other Ikari diets that get pushed, the gold and stable, honestly, I think they're a pile of shit. There's way better foods out there. It's just the sake stuff is what took it to another level. And even again, you see out there, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of the multi-season diet because, uh, yeah, I just think it's a product that's made for commercial reasons more than being a, a diehard, you know, specific product that's that's made for the hard cause if that makes sense uh let's have a look lee is all look yes jet like is a killer on the way back mate that that's a good question how many have tried saki food and didn't like it please feel free to put that in the comments if you are one of those people i would be curious to where uh, to see um, Christ, a lot of comments, folks. Really is. I, I think we've got a spammer here. Sorry, I've not seen that. This one here, uh, JPD Shoryak. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we'll put that one in a timeout, folks. There we go. Neil's in the house as well from Sunny Bank. How are you doing, pal?
There we go. Last one then. What do you think about the opinion? The more you push your fish when it's younger, shortens their lifespan. Yeah, I I think it comes down to how they're pushed. To be honest with you, uh, you know, excessive feeding can really wear them out, and and it also depends on genetics here in this case. Because naturally, something that can't grow, trying to force it to grow, is going to cause it problems. Uh, certain fish, I mean, you see like you, you single colored mujis. You know, you can just fire food at them all day long and they just keep going, just keep taking it. Uh, I've seen it with the Sakai fish, you know, they're almost bulletproof. Just keep throwing food at them and they'll just take it and keep growing. So I think that plays a massive part. And then it's just the general environment they're living in. But what you can't do is keep them on the grow 12 months of the year for two or three years on the bounce. They need a rest and recuperation period in between it. But the biggest kind of thinking these days is that it's actually becoming more better. And this is actually led from Sakai, and I'm, I'm buying into it, is, is we generally, because of the season, so in Japan there's a, there's a prolonged period of basically force feeding. Say force feeding, very intense feeding through the summer because you've only got potentially four, five, six-month period to get that growth. So at that point you really want to maximize on what you can do. The same as for you guys with the unheated ponds out there. You know, you want to maximize what you can do, but that's when you probably overstep the line, trying to go too far, too quick, too soon, because there's just this short period to get it on them. Whereas with the heating system in my fish houses, as I've got it now, I can have the luxury of a 12-month growing period. So I can plan that growth out over 12 months rather than trying to force it into five or six when I've got the ambient heat like I used to have. And that's made such a such a huge difference to how I'm looking at things now, maximizing it, but doing it in a slower and much steadier way. And I think that's the bit we've got to look at, you know, realistically, you know, can the fish, is the fish capable of handling it? Is it living in a bad environment because it is being pushed too hard? That's naturally going to be no good for it. Uh and yeah, the whole scenario and set up around it. So I think that's probably the way. But I have seen fish force too much. There's a particular farm renowned for its big fish where I think there's been years of that happening now, to be honest, uh, where they've been a bit too forced. And uh, it's ultimately led to a lot of mortalities at that farm, certainly with Azakari fish. And I think that's just generally there, a lack of upkeep as well, just firing that food in and not really paying attention to the fine lines. So uh yeah swings and roundabouts for that one uh, <laughs> uh i tried saki carry not bad but the push for it rather than me eat it all. <laughs> nice one uh right guys so video time fingers crossed after all that i'm not gonna let you down so this is what i filmed last week the super Dainichi collection, uh, I'll say Dainichi, 85, 90% Dainichi fish with a few others thrown in, but 100% male. There's some development stuff in there as well, looking at back at them from Tosai. So yeah, please sit back, enjoy it. And uh, when we come back, we're going to be talking Battle of the Breeders uh, event and some appreciation. What I've got for you today, the super male pond. Now this, this is just a reminder, coming back to that whole messaging when we started it, that you know this whole obsession of female fish and that males you know, can't achieve the growth, can't achieve the body, this, that and the other. This pond, the whole point of it was just to disprove that theory, really show what is capable. And it's getting there. So these is everything you're going to see in a moment are all Sansai now, not quite a full 36 months old. They sat around about 33 months now, I should imagine, 32, 33, somewhere like that. All been raised from Tosai, except for one or two fish. And I've got a lot of the certificates because it's primarily 90% Dainichi fish in here uh, with a few others now, but every single fish you're going to see is male. And yeah, they're, they're extreme. So let me flip it around and show you. You won't see the true coloration in the pond because the water's got that slight yellowness to it and the camera, it just messes it up. But I'm going to bowl a few up, show you the original certificates, talk through them a little bit and let you see where they're at. So this is the collection. I think the first thing I want to point out is body volume. When you look at these, two koaku in front of me look they're absolutely packing every koaku you look at there show a 
Sankey, you name it. The crazy black Zeus is in here as well. Like I say, really, guys, you cannot see the colour properly. You will when you get in the bowl. This Koaku. These are all fish, regardless of what they are gender-wise. You know, they're going to do incredible things. There's 75, 80 centimetre potential in them. I'm hopefully going to prove that that can be achieved and achieved in this environment. You know, this this has primarily always been male fish, so it's really played to their strengths. There was only a couple of females that grew with them last year. This eye to Sam's eye, so it's it's gave them every chance, which has never really been the case with male fish. You know, they get shoved to one side. It's only when breeders have been giving them the conditions they thrive in the most where you start seeing the results that we've been seeing. And you can take nothing away from these. This is a, an elite collection of fish. The highest level. And still not to mistake, you know, this is a very valuable collection of fish as well. It's just if these were female, I certainly wouldn't have this pond swimming around, you know, there'd be times three at the very least price wise. They're insane. I love this pond. I'm fascinated by it. I'm fascinated to see what can keep being achieved. So right now it's far too overstocked. My issue is however I cannot see I've already kind of selected and weaned this down. I cannot see what I'm going to take away from these next year. So it might just be a case of seeing what I can do holding this this stocking level. We'll have to wait and see. To be fair, the, the big pond over there, the big fishing has been way too overstocked from where I wanted it. And they've still achieved phenomenal things. The big Marusho Sanke I checked in on yesterday has gone from 73 to 79 cm already which I'm delighted with you know and the body volume is packed on has been crazy so yeah time time will tell here right now I hope you get the gist that Koaku there I think was about 65 last time I checked which is in line with you know female Sansa that get pulled from the mud pond at the likes of an NND or somewhere like that I'm not saying we're exactly in line with Dainichi uh, you know then things are they're pushing it on but these fish were always kind of against it even to the point of buying them as tosa you know they were behind on the fish being kept as tatigoi there because they had the period of being sold being shipped being quarantined they lost months out of that equation but they certainly you know my expectation of a quality sansai female is 65 cm that's kind of like where it needs to be and a lot of these are there as males as well here you can see what a lot of them were and again as I've learned you know when when they're hitting these kind of sizes and what I've learned from the Dainichi fish I bought over time is I think around the 20 cm mark they might have early indications of them being male the percentages were just too high over two years of buying in a quantity that nobody else has got near this thing really is turning out quite phenomenal as well and certainly at these sizes they can tell they're putting down a section now but they know what's happening so all of these fish are still in this pond this one was quite fascinating this was actually uh, i won a the time was it 37 so 38 boo miyabi prize at the wakagori toy show with that one This one's a firm fan favourite. It converts anybody who has ever seen it. It's gone, I'm not really into them. And then they've seen that. And uh, certainly as it looks at the minute, I'm done a complete U-turn on that. Here we move on to some of my favourites. So these are Dainichi Toyota from the Kinsen lineage as well. Two phenomenal pieces. I really did go out on a limb at the time to get them. This thing's transformed. So yeah, that's them. So let's pull a few up now and uh, take a closer look so i start with this one 30 cm on arrival as a tow side and yeah like i say the dainichi toyota kinsen line here we are today 
this measuring bowl only went up to 62 actually but uh, yeah I think this one's sat 63 64 now I just look at the body mass I've always said it you know this is about bone structure when the bone structure is right and that fish has always had it look the power the length the width the head the head especially this is where we end up I mean the Ben is just pure Dainichi and also this subset this Kinsen lineage obviously Kinsen was the All Japan uh, Koi, All Japan Koi Show Grand Champion that was a uh, Dainichi Toyota fish the Benny just seems to be a level above, which that fish was a level above with the Benny. But I mean, right now I'm anticipating where we're at size wise, this hopefully hit around 72 is where I'll be aiming for next year with this. The body volume that's going to come with that, it's just going to go with ease. I mean, you look at the height, look, these fish are solid as well. You know, when you actually get them, they are solid. That high down the head. Awesome. Just power. Sheer power. And this isn't just because obviously they have the genetics. Yes, there's no arguing that. That helps. But a lot of them fish out there have got the quality genetics these days. This is more about picking the right, say the structure. And you get that bit of the fish right and then give it the environment. Away we go. So this one was just phenomenal. This was the best fish in this auction at the time. Just look at that look. Bone structure perfection there. Look at the head and look how that's played out. Right here we've got a fish. If I can't get this to 80 cm, gonna be something wrong. With with big volume to come. I'm not saying it's female volume but it's gonna be, I mean it's huge now. It's just gonna fill out over time like any female fish would as well. But again the Benny that real Kinsen characteristic. The power in this fish is insane. Look at the backbone still. It's not finished filling out because the, the mass needs to expand around that backbone. That's what's gonna happen. The head look, the height. It's gonna be a scary, scary piece eventually. I'm thrilled with that one. The last time I was checking was about 65. I'd say there's Probably been a bit more on that now as well. Remarkable stuff. So again, Dainichi Niigata this one. Offspring of Wild. I have a good success with that particular parent set and becoming quite fond of it. But again, look at the bone structure. Just look at nothing else. Head, shoulders, and then boom. This is probably one of the harder fish to compute as being a male piece right now. Just look at the mass, it is huge. Quality wise, look, look at that Benny. It's just unbelievable. The power, you know, that's sitting about 63, that was from 25 cm. You can see there. It is a bonkers fish. Again, the mass this is going to carry by this point next year is just going to be staggering. And over 70, I'm going to anticipate, or around 70, 70, 72 will be the target. It's just going to be bonkers. Again, Shiroji take nothing away. Male fish, yes, they will tend to carry a bit more yellow. The only reason these aren't absolutely glistening white right now is the diet they've been on. They're still growing quite intensively. Although I have stripped the colour food out at the minute, they're just on growth. But they've not been in any conditioning phase. They're still still being raised. But what a piece. So this one's gonna shock you. This was actually, I think, a second prize winner at the Wakagoi that year. Now, this sumi here, as it showed quite early, is not good quality sumi. This is the sort of stuff, that, as I saw it on the picture, I didn't expect it to be around at this eye. Very superficial, kind of top of the skin, very much baby sumi. You see there, 37 cm from the Super Monster line. And now, this is currently where this fish is at. 
one of my favorite pieces in here actually so what happened here again nothing that panicked me and again look at that it's male really actually even got quite a curvaceous line underneath which looks more female so yeah this sumi as soon as this fish started growing it felt a bit of heat that sumi all fell off and then what happened we left with the true sumi underneath which then slowly begins to emerge and come up over time and the real quality at the point it's coming through now it's getting that real depth black alike quality to it exactly what i expected so it was no shock to me to see that happen patience with the head is needed it's teasing all this sumi here is fairly new motoguro coming back all been there it's just a case of time but what a fish when that head does truly come back and the rest of the body what a shower really awesome the size as well i mean we're talking we're about 65 66 on this one now maybe bigger now it was that when i last checked in what a piece but that kind of development is nothing to be alarmed by like i say you can see here look you can see the scalation in the sumi that's what's the indicator that there wasn't quality to it now you can't but when you see the finished sumi now especially that side it's getting real depth when it gets that depth you can't see the scalation and that's quality sumi but again what a piece what a piece if this is female at dainichi we're talking telephone numbers and that that is reality i watch it happen all the time so i think now's a good time for the beast that is so this was the first year these were released by dainichi an unknown entity they were fetching crazy crazy fish and this was the best they had to offer it was exceptional it was a hell of a battle to get it and my god was it worth it because we sat now around that 65 cm mark and that body hasn't gone away look you saw the power the width everything there the head and boom so this does carry a bit of strong yellowing which I don't think the colour food would help this has actually whitened up quite a lot since the colour food has been removed and it may never come you know super white you just can't deny how impressive this is it is humongous look the mass of it so you've had a similar thing happen with the sumi here this actually fell back way more than this I've got a video clip I'll share at some point where there was almost no sumi and then over time it's re-emerged the head's still waiting look and the motogoro in the fins is still waiting although it is there it's coming you can see the head pattern actually re-emerging on the nose where it wasn't really so much in the first place but you can see around the sides of the face starting again as well look. this fish just doesn't never fails to impress it is quite special what they've done having joints fish with this kind of body is just not normal that's what I find so impressive and you see this sumi quality mixed with the ginrin I'm just fascinated by them I really hope we do see a comeback with these this year so uh, yeah through to next year for the tow side so one of the last two I'm going to share really really rare beasts from Dainichi Arsanki I did mop up quite a few from that particular year they seem to have a good spawn only two remain in this pond but this is really looking dream but again here the zoom is probably the bit you're going to get which is this exact same process more common with showa uh, sankey than showa yeah look at that but what you see i mean this zoom was good to be fair it's gone it went completely and now we're starting to come back through at three years old look at the quality of that sumi it is immense breaking through there the sumo sumi that's going to take a bit longer because benny always it acts as like a buffer brings it up faster what a piece this one overall is not going to get the same. I, I think, you know, we might end up around 70, 
five-ish mark as a as a sort of when it starts to real peter out with the growth. What a delight. Again, the power in that body, you can see the bone structure. Look at the power. That height of Insanity, I love it. So again, possibly overlook this one because of the lack of sumo, which is something you've got to be so careful of. I picked this again based on, look at that head, look at the mouth. Quality just looked insane. What Sumi was there looked insane. You've got to give these things time. It's a toe side, 25 cm. X Ginnerin of Dainich is just super, super high demand. And this is one of those radical, radical transformations. Just look at that now. There's not a lot more to say about this and just still getting better as the Sumi is knitting together. All this sumi here was smaller, isolated spots, all blocking together now, which is a normal process. It's coming from everywhere. What a fish. Absolute dream. And even as a ginrin look, a ginrin male, ginrin makes it more difficult from a growth perspective with most lineages. Then you say male, but that's keeping up with the others. You know, that's a, 60, maybe 61-ish CM fish, maybe 62 now. Just insane. Look at that. There we go, folks. What do you reckon to that lot? Bear with me while I get that off the screen. Hang on a minute. I've got a bit too much going on. There we go. Uh, yeah, so what do you think to them? Uh what do you think to male fish now? If you didn't have an opinion already or you had one form that they weren't for you, do you reckon you'd like building a collection like that? Because that pretty much, like you said, although that's not a, a cheap collection of fish, uh, if it was female, they wouldn't be there. That's that's the simple part of that, unless I'd got lucky. But uh, let's face it, I've made it quite clear. Those guys clearly know what they're all about from quite a small size uh, where it comes to... To that stuff. So, <laughs> uh, cheers, Richard. Uh, and no, Mickey, it's not up for auction, buddy, at all. So uh, I'd be prized away from me that one big time. But yeah, I can't wait to uh, I can't wait to get those uh, cracking on next year, and and really see where we can take them uh, in the end. To be fair, because like I say, I think there's there's eighty cm potential in a couple of them. And, and certainly the majority are pretty much uh, with these going to get into the 75-ish the mark. And possibly on that, we might go further, but uh, let's not over-egg it. Let's just see where where they end up. And let's say um, two years, two years, uh, yeah, two years into that project now. And there's still a long way to go. They're very, very young fish. So moving on. Uh the event, Battle of the Breeders. So you saw the Secret Sankey event last year. Now, this is not a sort of the full public announcement. This today is giving you guys the heads up. All the guys that follow me uh, on Question Time and watch the video live and afterwards, you guys are getting a chance to get in first with this one. Now, this year's event, Battle of the Breeders, is hosted at Newark Showground again. Uh, it's a physical event that takes part at the venue. You can also take part if you can't attend the, any selection of the fish. We can do remotely with you, so that's not a problem. Uh, but, yeah, where we're at with this one. So the venue is booked for the 27th and 28th of April. Uh, Battle of the Breeders is actually going to take part on the 27th on the Saturday. So, uh, like I say, I'm not giving full details today, but ideally you want to be available to attend uh, on that particular day, for one. Uh, the best part, the best way to enjoy it is being part of it. Uh, on that Saturday, the event is only open to the participants, uh, the ticket holders, and the guests uh, that we allow them to bring, uh, typically plus ones like last year. So, and yeah, this year it's hosted uh, with Sunnybank Koi and JPN Koi Co. Now, you may be asking who that is, some of you. 
JP Enco has actually been set up by, uh, I say my other half, if she's actually watching this, my other work half, or was, Chris, before he abandoned me. Uh, yeah, that's what he abandoned me for, to venture off into uh, the big wide world himself and, and, yeah, live out some of the ambitions that he'd got. So, yeah, the dream team, really. I think it'd be an absolute crack between us all. <laughs> <laughs> she's there. <laughs> uh, dear, I'm sure she's not going to let me uh, forget that now. Uh, yeah, so that's that's the plan. That's the date. Uh, I'm going to be releasing more. So the the most important thing, first of all, is guys get in our WhatsApp uh, group. So like I say, it's not a conversational one. We just post out updates on there. So your phone won't be pinging all the time. But I'll get the screen over now. Best thing you can do is get that joined. So, you know, all exclusive kind of updates, you will hear them first uh, there. And from there, I'll redirect you. I'll be publicizing uh, both Sunny Banks and JPN's WhatsApp groups uh, before we do the release. So ticket price uh, is 495 like last year. What that's going to include is the fish on the day, which when everybody's there, that's done by lucky draw to decide the selection order. And the fish is then going to be taken away like with last year and raised by me at Koi Wholesale, but this year for uh, a longer period of time. We've not fixed the date yet, but we're looking at September for part two uh, of the event when the fish will be ready for collection. And again, we'll have the judging and everything going on there, the prizes and the wider event like we had last year as well. You will also have noticed I announced two dates, 27th and 28th. That's because we're holding it over two days. On the first day, that's like, say, for ticket holders and their guests. Day two is actually going to be a fully open event where tickets will be released for you to just come and attend the, the wider event that we'll have on. Let's say full information of that is going to get released properly at some point. Right now, the focus is on the, the sort of Battle of the Breeders part. But on the day two, I have got something special lined up, and I'm not quite sure at what point I'm going to drop that on you guys. So be ready for it. And if you are looking at participating on the Saturday with the Battle of Breeders, I really, really would recommend trying to make it a two-day. I'm sure you'll be able to sort of camp out at Newark Showground, as a lot do, or get yourself booked in somewhere uh, nearby and make the most of the weekend. So, yeah, you've probably gathered from the uh, – oh, yeah, the last bit. So uh, we're going to put details out through WhatsApp. But basically this Sunday, the pre-ordering uh, for those tickets is going to be available through JPN Coy and Sunny Bank Coy. So you're going to be able to get your name down early doors before we make the very full public announcement through our mailing lists, YouTube channel, et cetera. Uh, yeah, I've got some of the fish for you to preview, but you probably tell from the Battle of the Breeders element, uh, it's not just one breeder this year. I really was wondering how we could top last year because I think we did a mighty fine job uh, of delivering both with the quality of the fish and then the end results. But yeah, uh, pushed it a little bit further. And I was It's when I was on the uh, Shinkansen, to be honest with you, in Japan in December. I was wondering what the hell I was going to be able to get to try and top it from a fish perspective and something just came up and i managed to get a deal done that i knew is actually going to make it almost impossible for me to beat next year but battle of the breeders just a few names i'm going to mention it's not just two it's not just three it's a handful of or say two handfuls really of elite breeders and fish from them so we have got to name but a few and i think i might have missed a few in all this as well so uh We've got fish from Beppu, Momotero, Issa, Kawakami, Kondo, Marado, Suzuse, Yamaguchi, Sekiguchi, Tamora. I'd say I think there's a few more in amongst it as well. And the quality and the standard of the fish has just gone way beyond, as you're going to see uh, in a moment. But uh, yeah, overall, I'm delighted with what's on offer. Like I say, these fish are going to get raised over a longer uh, period and they also all come with original certification uh, as well so let me just switch this out because I've got a screen set up for this so you can look at the uh, the fish and my lovely face at the same time guys and yeah I'm just going to go I'm not going to go with too much to this uh, I've kept you for quite a while now but this is just going to give you an idea of some of the fish that will be uh, available on it
this honestly going to be absolutely buzzing. I can't remember the breeders of all these. It's been a while since I uh, sorted it out, but I mean, look at that once again. The best thing about it is we've got a mix of variety in there as well. Let me not forget get to mention that. Uh, Showa Sanki Koaku, there's some Ginrin Sankis you're going to see. There's a few Shiro Otsoris. There's even a couple of Shisuis from the Kawakami few Ginringoshkis from Kawakami as well. It's just a lot more diversity overall uh, to really broaden that appeal. But, I mean, look at that. Absolutely. The level of these fish is superb. Uh, really, really is. I'm delighted. I mean, look at this, look. The potential in that, like I say, the caliber of the breeders behind it all as well. To get all this in at this price point, I mean, trust me, these are part of a wider deal I strung together to really get it in. Uh, and obviously all the growing and everything considered, you guys have seen the results time and time again. You're not just looking at what's in front of you with these. It's that end prospect. I do know this is actually a Marido Sankey. Again, one of the heavyweights, superb fish, amazing potential. Uh, that's Shiro Sori, amazing. That's actually from Tamora. I do remember that. Let me just look at that. Dreamy, dreamy potential. Sankey, superb piece. I couldn't actually actually get all these uh, on the screen, but this one's going to be proper. Look at that. Absolutely amazing. I'm going to get even more excited again when I remember, I get the certificates and remember what breeders uh, all these individual bits were from. Then there you go, a little bit of diversity. There's actually a few Ginrin Sankeys in there from Beppu. He's, uh, he's doing really, really well uh, with that stuff at the moment. He really is. Amazing, Pete. I mean, look at the quality of that. I have gone absolutely, uh, like I say, all out with this, which uh, as much as it's going to be absolutely banging this year, uh, it's is, it is going to make it a real challenge for me next year. I mean, look at that, look. Absolutely dreamy, dreamy piece, that one. So if you just bear with me for one second, I can remove a few of these and uh, and get a few more in just to show you. But as you can see, guys, these are top, top pieces. This is typically stuff, again, I would uh, really just look to grow on myself over the summer and release as Nisai, but it's going to be amazing. You're going to get that chance to follow that journey and just be in on the whole event uh, with it. So, uh, again, just give me a second. There we go. Look, again, diversity. Ginringoshki there from Kawakami. What a little piece that is. So, so, so exciting. Yeah, this is actually quite difficult because I can't see everything on there properly. But yeah, look at that. Standard. Uh, yeah, struggling with them others. It's not wanting to, to really play ball uh, all that much. But I think from those, you've got a pretty good gist of uh, exactly where that one is heading, to be honest. So just to reiterate, I would recommend, or even without that, to be honest, you can get in touch with uh, Sonny Bank Coy and... Chris at JPN Coy. Uh, you can look him up on Facebook to begin with. Uh, that's what Lisa's just asked. Look, where's Chris gone? JPN Coy Co. Limited. Living out his dreams, and I cannot fault him for it. Still working closely together, which is nice, uh, as we do with Sunny Bank. But like I say, collectively, there's going to be dry goods spread there, all the fish available uh, on both days. And like I say, the second event, the day two, going to be open to a wider audience so even if you're not participating with any of the fish you can buy the tickets to come and attend like you did and there is going to be a special little caveat or a special little treat on that day uh sizes you can't quite remember i think we're sat between generally 15 to 20 cm on them but they're going to be already grown and pushed a bit before the event because even from arriving uh they're going to be in the warmth so yeah be big changes uh Agreed, it will be an event like no other, but that's what we're going for. So fingers crossed that is what is delivered. Uh, yeah, you join them. You can feel free to contact them. Like I say, tickets are 495. They are limited to one per person initially. Uh, and then after the full formal release, what you can do at the time, if you wanted to bag yourself a ticket, 
you can request to be put on a waiting list in case you want any additional ones after that. So when the full release has been done, if there are any more available, uh, you'll be contacted and you'll have the chance then to get uh, any extra ones if they're available. And uh, it will need to buy Sunday tickets if we enter the main event. No, Eddie, uh, you will be welcome for the whole weekend, uh, of course. We'll be catering it as we did, uh, looking to do something uh, pretty cool again. I'm not quite sure if we'll get the guy, uh, Meat Castles, we had last year. If you look that guy up, the most insane burgers around. He's actually getting uh, national recognition at the minute for this. So them guys, I told you that was something special. Uh, I'm going to try, but let's see. Well, I know he's a super, super busy man now. Oh, yeah, Jason, there we go. So, yeah, we're, it's limited to 50 tickets again uh, this year. There is actually 80 fish. Thanks for that prompt, Jason. Uh, there's going to be over 80 pieces to choose from again, so absolutely plenty of choice uh, on the day. But we are limiting it to only 50 participants uh, on that, so... Yeah, I uh, I think it's going to go down well. And yes, Neil, you're right, mate. You cannot be uh, meat castles. <laughs> Here's Chris, look. <laughs> but I'm not guaranteed, like I say, guys. I know we're getting a bit excited about that now, more than the fish. But uh, yeah, let's let's see where we uh, where we get with with that one. But there will be some good, very good catering involved. So please, I'll get it on once more. If you're not in the WhatsApp group. Get into it because, like I say, that's where we're posting the most stuff of what we're doing, you know, fish that are coming available, bits and bobs, just random updates. So really worth it. Like I say, it's not a chat group. Your, your phone's not going to be pinging all the while, uh, just every now and again when I've got something to uh, to share with you guys. So, yeah, there we go. Uh, happy days. Thank you for everyone who's tuned in. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh Video, I actually enjoyed watching that male video again. That they are staggering. We'll keep you posted with all that and I'll see what I can get done for uh next week, to be fair. And uh yeah, dedicate a bit more time to some questions next week as well. But don't forget the Koi Talk podcast is dropping on Sunday, and then that will be dropping every Sunday from here on in. So uh yeah, there we go. Once again, thanks to everyone tuned in. We actually peaked at 230 viewers on the live stream this week. Absolutely amazing to see. And obviously, of course, there's the rerun uh, if you want to watch it back. But for now, that's all from me for this week. And uh, yeah, I'll catch you next week.